towing a heavy trailer, presumably in hell. Do you really need to add that expensive transmission oil cooler? That's next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. This quick tip is aimed specifically at getting car owners just like you the information you need fast, all inspired by questions from you, which deluge me, if that's a verb. I'm adding these as a separate playlist, okay, on the channel homepage in case you want to watch some more reports like this. And of course, they will build up over time. Once we deal with this burning issue of oil cooler or not, we'll have some nuts from the comments feed to roast as well. And I always find that uplifting on a Friday afternoon, and I hope you do too. If you like this report, please consider subscribing and hit the bell notification icon too if you know what's good for you. Subscribers will not be systematically eliminated when my plans for world domination are realised in due course. Just like to know if it's a good idea to fit an aftermarket transmission oil cooler to my vehicle. Also to install a thermostatic cooler bypass valve. I do travel north a lot with a camper and up to 900 kilometres just worried about excess heat in the transmission. Look, I get where Don's concern is coming from here, but what I'm wondering is, is it being built on an underlying logical foundation? As an engineer, the way I look at this is, have you measured the transmission oil temperature or other salient operating temperatures and drawn some rational conclusion that something needs to be modified? Or are you just guessing? Are we using evidence? Have we plugged in some Bluetooth dongle and become concerned because the transmission oil temperature during one of these top-end caravanning hell-on-earth incursions is higher than the maximum permissible oil operating temperature limit in the oil specifications? Because that's how they'd reach such a determination that something needed to be done in R&D. Specific hot weather tow testing on all 4x4s is done before the vehicle is approved for production. And sometimes, of course, they get it wrong, but mostly they get it right. Alternatively, is there evidence, perhaps, that on your make and model of 4x4, that there are premature failures of the transmission stemming from over temps while towing in hot climates? Is there evidence? This is like in-service evidence that something was undercooked in R&D, or in this case, overcooked. Are outback highways increasingly littered with the smoking hulks of vehicles such as yours, with their transmissions entrails sprayed inelegantly all over the highway? I'd suggest, you know, that a lot of men simply spend their downtime streaming what amounts to modification porn. And hey, it's a victimless crime. I don't even think you go to hell for that. Well, not anymore. But you might wake up in automotive hell, I'd suggest, if you actually make unnecessary modifications, especially on a brand new car. If you suffer from CMD, compulsive modification disorder, it's all very confusing, because there's another medical condition with exactly those initials that would most likely get you arrested in a public park. Anyway, if you have the automotive strain of CMD, it can cost you a bomb. You'll be essentially devoting a lot of time, effort and money to solving, if that's the right word, a problem if that's the right word, that most likely does not actually exist. And if that's the case, you're doing a completely redundant activity. In addition to wasting money and time, right, redundant modifications such as these are a great way to increase complexity, which potentially reduces reliability because those two things are inevitably conflicted. They're always at war. Reliability and complexity, right? And it can introduce malicious feedback effects, if you are not careful, which will cause premature failures, big ones, which is exactly what you're trying to avoid here, right? So if that happens, 
Modifications like these will easily void what's left of your factory warranty, especially if a catastrophic failure of the cooler or the bypass valve or some other aspect of this modification dumps your transmission's lifeblood all over the road somewhere between Outback Shithole A and Outback Shithole B, after which there's generally a very loud noise and deafening silence, followed by a protracted delay and of course a five-figure repair bill, and nobody wants that. You know, just picture it. All that R&D that was done at the factory, getting vulnerable components out of the way of whatever, pursued with great zeal by a team of engineers who take this stuff quite seriously, and then a stone flicks up and hits that expensive aftermarket solenoid valve. Suddenly you've got no more oil, no more transmission. You're not having any more outback fun. Game, set and match for a problem that might not have existed. You're going to be picking up the tab for that too, completely. You'll be on your own. The factory, the dealer will wash their hands of you because of this modification. So unless there is actual evidence, give the engineers some credit for enduring that extreme hot weather toe testing in R&D. They went through a fair bit of hardship to get that car approved. Generally, the factory will recommend fitting an oil cooler with a tow kit if a transmission durability problem comes to light in R&D. So if there is evidence, absolutely go for it. Fit that cooler, fit the factory one if such a unit exists. And if not, do it completely overkill. Use the best cooler, the best hardware, the best hoses, whatever, and the best tradesmen you can find to do the fitting. Do not scrimp on any of this. Do not DIY it unless you have high level trade competency in this domain. And I'd also suggest a lot of this has to do with how close to the ATM and GCM limits that you are at when you're towing your particular implement behind. That is, the aggregate trailer mass, which is the most heavily laden weight of the trailer, and the gross combination mass, the all-up weight of the loaded trailer and the loaded vehicle combined. Cruising speed matters too. It's really significant because you're pushing a hell of a lot of air out of the way while you're doing this and that consumes prodigious energy and it generates a lot of heat therefore. Small reductions in cruising speed make a huge difference to aerodynamic drag so you might want to knock it back 10 k's an hour or something when the mercury hits 40. Operating at a really high ambient temperature reduces the convective heat loss capacity of the vehicle's various cooling systems, obviously. But manufacturers tend to be, A, very cruel to prototypes in R&D. It's all dissard down there. And B, very conservative on limits and cooling capacities by the time the vehicle finally makes it into production. So you know how it is with doctors, right? The Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. And in my view, that's not a bad way to approach all modifications. And of course, don't be treating the patient at all if the patient is not actually sick. I hope this helps. If you're still with me at this point, you might want to think about subscribing and nudging that bell icon. That would help me. And if you're a hater, perhaps selling transmission coolers by the pallet load to the unsuspecting public punch that dislike button. And hey, do it twice. It'll make one of us feel awesome. And I, I really couldn't care less how you feel about it at all. Thanks for watching. Now, let us crack a few nuts on a Friday, Arvo. Yes! I love this. I truly do. And it's all courtesy of you. For fuck's sake, stop talking and looking into the camera while driving. It is dangerous and irresponsible. It's driving distracted just like using a mobile phone in the car. You of all people should know that, John. I'm sure the police would have someone to say about it too. Well, goodness me, Austin. The education system really has let you down. And I'm very sorry about that. Please accept my apologies on behalf of society. It's terrible leaving school unable to punctuate. It's a real liability. But not being able to spell, Ugh. that's a disgraceful liability tantamount to being disabled here in 
Australia. During car reviews, I'll have you know that I absolutely mitigate risk. I do not knowingly break any laws and I carefully select the roads based on safety. And I'd respectfully suggest that talking to a camera is actually no different in the domain of distraction than talking to a passenger in the friggin' front seat. As for the cops being interested, I certainly hope they are. And a quick shout out to any boys in blue wearing that uniform who enjoy my reports anywhere around the world. You guys do a tough job that many of us civilians just could not hack. And let's not forget, you run the opposite way to most people when the chips are right down. So there's that. Hashtag respect. As for pieces to camera while driving, I've been doing this rather a long time. Not my first rodeo, mate. And now, some viewer feedback on the safety shitbox we know and love as the 2019 Jeep Wrangler. Nothing fun is safe, nothing good to eat is healthy, and moderation is boring. Life sucks unless you eat bacon and four-wheel. Well, golly gee, Jim Bob. I just can't help but feel sorry for all the Jews and Muslims out there in the audience who just learned, if that's the right word, from Brian, why their life actually sucks. And I'm wondering if he went to the same punctuation school as Austin. We'll never know. Also, I might add, plenty of fun cars are actually safe, plenty of healthy food tastes great, like cheese and red wine, for example. The French, they live forever. So there's that. But the Wrangler remains a safety disgrace. And while we're on about this, why not address this comment? I hope Fiat Chrysler sues all these liars. It is a five-star rating in all other countries. Ricky, 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 where do we start? Wrangler is rated at one star by ANCAP here in Shitsville and also by Euro NCAP. And there are... 195 countries in the world last time I look, and I think 49 of them are in Europe. That's if you include Russia and Vatican City. The Vatican's technically not part of Italy, of course, and the Italians must hate that, but there it is. Facts are facts, so inconvenient. So that's 50, including Shreya, and 51 with Sheep Shagistan just over there in the east. That's part of ANCAP too, last time I looked. Now... In addition to that, Wrangler is unrated by ASEAN NCAP. There's 10 more countries there, so that's 61. And it's unrated by Latin NCAP. 22 more countries in Latin America, if memory serves. That's uh, 83 countries in total, where it's not five star. Couldn't find it on China's NCAP website or Korea's, so perhaps we should make that 85. And at this point, Ricky's hypothesis is looking a bit shaky, I must say. Unrated by Japan's NCAP, so 86, double IHS in America, doesn't use stars actually, but rated the Rutatistani Wrangler marginal in a side impact in 2017. Couldn't find 2019 for double IHS, that's 87 countries. Uh, and NHTSA, right? NHTSA, in the, the regulator in the United States, they gave it four stars for frontal crash performance and just three for rollover. So we're still at 87 countries where it's not five star. 66 different countries in Africa, I think. Depends on how you define country. Uh, things are inevitably a bit fluid in Africa when it comes to borders. But anyway, that's 100 and 53 countries where it's not five. And Canada probably lunches off the USA on this and so many other things as well. That's 154. You know, there's 41 other countries in the world and frankly, by this point, I could not be asked correlating Wrangler ratings with them. But the one thing I did search for was a single country in the world that rated the 2019 Wrangler five stars on friggin' safety. And guess what? That's right. Not a single one. Not that I could find, at least. But hey, I'm fallible. If you can find one, give me a shout in the comments feed below. And I will respect that. So apparently, this is it. <laughs> Humanity, right? We can't agree on so many things, on sovereign borders, human rights, gender equality, the one true God. Who is it really? 
or which side of the damn road to drive upon, and a thousand other things that matter, right? We can't agree on any of that, but the one thing we do agree on, seemingly, is that the Jeep Wrangler is a safety shitbox. So that's nice.